All right, everybody. Well, welcome to this event. It's entitled Maximizing Post-Pandemic Events, and it is about hosting hybrid meetings. So pandemic restrictions required us to host meetings remotely. And now that those restrictions are lifted, we may want to go back to the way things were before. But we learned a lot about hosting that, um, that would benefit us to reflect on today. So that's what we're going to do in today's session. This is a 90 minute workshop and we'll start with an overview of hybrid meetings, which means that some participants are in person and others are using video conference systems from other locations. After that, we'll talk about registration, device setup, venue setup, and Zoom tips. We'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So please hold your questions or type them in the chat. Pandemic restrictions required us to find new ways to engage. And that necessity brought forth new inventions, including virtual meetings. Though we resorted to Zoom because we had to, we also realized that this form of interaction had some real advantages over in-person meetings. So some of those are that, um, some of the benefits are that these meetings were more inclusive. So as we all noted, anybody with a phone, tablet, or computer could attend even while traveling or during a lunch break at work. They were also environmentally friendly because no transportation was required. They were time efficient because participants could attend multiple meetings during a day. And for the same reasons, they were work efficient. Some of us actually multitasked while we were doing Zoom meetings. We would do some of our other work while we were attending meetings. We also were allowed to invite broader a broader speaker base. We ourselves here in San Diego had at least one or two meetings where we featured panelists and speakers from the East Coast. It was very exciting to have access to these other speakers. It was cost effective because we didn't have to pay for venues or rooms or purchase food. And um, the text-based option is also something to be considered. The chat feature gives introverts an option to express themselves without having to show their faces or feel the fear that might be associated with um, interacting in other ways face-to-face. -face. So let's take a look at the chat. Kim, do you wanna read some other issues or um, benefits that people talked about in the chat? Yeah, so people mentioned having more, more people attend and also having the polling function for voting is great. Not having to travel somewhere is definitely a big one. I also think I saw one somewhere about childcare. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely an important one, not having to get childcare to attend a meeting. Excellent. So there are a lot of benefits that we've all already experienced by hosting remote meetings. So our purpose here today is to try to capture those and figure out how to maximize those opportunities and also to move forward in a real life world. Though we enjoy seeing each other in real life, we must acknowledge meetings that offer virtual attendance are a best practice. So today we're going to discuss how to host a hybrid meeting that includes in-person and virtual attendance. In preparation for this presentation, we conducted research and hosted a hybrid meeting to ensure that we have the best information available. But this is still a work in progress and we're trying to work it out like everyone else. Okay, so um, this work in progress includes the, starting with a checklist. So when Kim and I got together and decided how we were gonna move forward with this, we decided to organize this in a way that is very, um, checklisty, you'll see on our slides that we have a lot of data. We're kind of breaking one of the first rules of doing a presentation by putting a lot of data on our slides. We did that specifically so that you would have access to this information. After this presentation is over, you will obviously be able to view it um, in um, YouTube, on YouTube, but we also want you to be able to have access to the slides and use this data. So we're going to quickly go through this checklist, but what we're going to do in subsequent slides is drill down on some of these items to give you a little bit better idea about what we're talking about. So as you can see here, you know, the first thing to start with is registration. So, you know, we, you're going to have to provide opportunities for, to register, for people to register online and in person. And then, of course, you're going to need a venue that is quiet because, as you know, microphones pick up all kinds of extraneous noise. You'll have to pay attention to the room capacity. Depending on the municipality where you are and any of the restrictions that are still imposed there, you might have only, um, you might only have the option to per 
perhaps have maybe a 20% occupancy, 50% occupancy. So you'll need to double check your room capacity regarding spacing and occupancy. You'll need a stable internet connection, obviously. And we always suggest having a phone hotspot as a backup. And we've designed this whole workshop around tools and applications that we presume you already have and are using. So this one is gonna be discussing the Zoom flat platform. We're gonna also introduce a couple of other applications that are, very, that are either free or minimal, minimal fees. So what we did was use one large screen desktop computer for the in-person and Zoom audiences to see each other and a laptop for Zoom administration. Those were in the venue. And then an optional third device would be a phone or a tablet on a tripod or propped up to stream a featured speaker who's facing the in-person audience. And you'll need two meeting managers, the facilitator who runs the meeting and manages in-person attendees, and then the tech facilitator who manages online attendees. And we'll have details about these on subsequent slides. So this is kind of what Kim was talking about. So this right here is an example of what we would consider perhaps a board meeting or just a small committee meeting. And so as Kim said, you can see right here, we suggest having your tech facilitator kind of in a central location of your table. This would be our meeting manager or the person who's running this particular committee meeting or board meeting. And then we have our attendees. You'll see that they are situated here kind of at the end of this table because over here at the far end, we've propped our big screen computer that Kim just mentioned. So this is recording the attendees. You can see hopefully close in here. You can see that this is a Zoom call with some people in attendance here, and they are viewing the live attendees here through this computer camera and the mic um, the, and audio. So the video and audio here is capturing what's going on live in the meeting here. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you click a Zoom link, it opens right into Zoom, and other times it takes you to a web page that asks for your name and email address? When you schedule a Zoom meeting, you'll decide whether you require your attendees to register or whether you'll simply send them the link to join the meeting. Collecting names and ad email addresses through required registration allows you to monitor the number of registrants and capture details of attendees for follow-up communication. You can also choose the setting to manually approve registrants before they receive a Zoom login. If you require attendees to register, they'll see a page like the one shown here when they click the link. Then on the next slide, the simplest way to invite people to a hybrid meeting is just to send an email with both the Zoom link and a link to register for the in-person meeting. Um, since most likely you'll have capacity restrictions, you probably will wanna collect RSVPs. So the example here is using Evite. Um, we're also gonna go through Eventbrite and Sign Up Genius, and they have options so that you can just use one invitation link. Um, for example, our website event calendar, it only has one register now button. You can see where the blue arrow is pointing. So we needed just one registration link that can accommodate both our online and in-person attendees. As you can tell that Kim and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out the registration aspect of this. I mean, this is a very complicated subject anyway, but uh, we, we did spend a lot of time researching and testing out different types of registration. So what you see on your screen now is an Eventbrite registration form. So um, the Eventbrite is a free registration system. It allows you to create two ticket types with different capacity limits. So as I said before, you know, you might have an in-person venue that has a restricted um, attendee participant limitation, but you might have a Zoom account too that you need to pay attention to as far as capacity and number of registrants. So this particular, this sample here using Eventbrite allows you to keep track of how many people are registering on both of those methods. And the key to success here is to customize your confirmation email 
Um, and I'm going to get to that right now. So this is, again, this is eventbrite.com. You've probably all used it. You're probably familiar with it. We use it very extensively here in San Diego. It's free. And this is what you what it looks like when you set up the two person or the two type ticket types. And then your slide that you would provide your two different ticket type attendees with, you can customize in this method right here. So if you're in Eventbrite, you would go to additional settings under confirmation order and then just click customize. And then you would be able to customize both of those options, your in-person and your Zoom registration to look something like this. So as you can see at the bottom of your screen, you can include the Zoom login, or you can actually just put the Zoom, the actual Zoom link. So you can either send people to register at the bottom there on the Zoom one, or you can just put the actual join link. Sign Up Genius is another registration system that many leagues are familiar with. It accommodates two ticket types called slots with different capacity limits. Paid Sign Up Genius accounts, which start at $108 per year, can create a custom confirmation email. Next slide. As you can see here, the Sign Up Genius confirmation email has been customized to include the Zoom link. Note that it will send the same email to both types of registrants. So the in-person attendees would also receive the note at the bottom that, it, that, says, that includes the Zoom link. Um, but if you look up above that, it says you signed up for colon and then Zoom login. And this is where in-person attendees would see you signed up for in-person attendance. Okay, so you've scheduled your meeting and you've managed your in-person and online attendance. Now it's time to set up your meeting. So we're going to talk through some of the um, products that we used and how we configured them. So in our case, we used an iMac and a used one costs about $500, um, a 2018 one. So, and I'm sure, as I said, many of you probably already have in your leagues, desktops, laptops, other items that you use. So again, we customized this so that we would take advantage of what we believe you probably already are using. So this would be the configuration for the computers. You'd have the large screen computer connected to Zoom at the front of the room for an in-person Zoom attendees to see each other, just like I showed you in that little graphic we had earlier with my pointer. The audio speaker volume um, would be high and the mic would be on. And then the video would, would be on active speaker mode. And then the camera, of course, will be on and pointed at in-person attendees like I showed you so that the two different kinds of participants could see each other. And then the laptop that the tech facilitator would use, the configuration for that should be audio off, mic would be muted, and then the camera could be optional. She could turn it on or not, depending on how she wanted to move forward. So what your meeting manager will need to do is set and follow the agenda engage and recognize in-person attendees, consult with the tech facilitator for virtual attendee participation, and then consolidate and confirm any votes or consensus by all attendees. Okay, so if you're interested in using the Zoom poll feature, you'll follow the instructions on the Zoom website, or you can just stay tuned for Zoom tips at the end of this presentation. If you prefer to ask attendees to raise their hand, we'll review how to tabulate those votes on a later slide as well. So just FYI, when you get these slides, we've hotlinked this for you to that actual support page that talks about how to use Zoom polls. I'm sure many of you already know how to use those and have been using them for a while now. So the setup for the duties for the tech facilitator are, are as you can see here, they monitor online attendees for raised hands, chat messages, Attendees offsite should be muted when not talking, and they should enable, be able to enable she, screen sharing. Um, and then, of course, record the meeting for later viewing if they want to. If you have a featured speaker who will address the group in person, one option is to have them stand at the front of the room facing the in person attendees, like the computer. By using a phone logged into Zoom as her camera and microphone, the virtual attendees will see the speaker featured on their screen. Okay, so the Zoom device, which is preferably a phone, it, because it won't block the view between the face-to-face -face attendees and the speaker, as you can see, is on a tripod or set on a podium pointed at the speaker. 
and the tech facilitator should mute the big screen computer that she's standing nearby so that it doesn't pick up her words and her any of her um, you know, comments. So the, she should ideally be using her own phone as her device with the others in the room muted. For candidate forums, we recommend setting up a tripod mounted phone as the Zoom device. And you can see the yellow arrow is pointing to that. And when it's their turn, a candidate moves to the podium to speak. The tech facilitator would mute this device when no one is at the podium. The moderator at another podium uses a laptop or phone for Zoom and mutes when she's not speaking. Okay, so this concludes the actual presentation portion. We left a lot of time for Q&A, but we, before we get to that, we have some Zoom tips that we'd like to share with you. Some of these are things you probably already know, but if you don't, this will be a good opportunity for you to try out some things that we've been talking about and maybe some things that um, you hadn't, haven't seen before. So just FYI, a PDF of our slides is now available on our website. Um, we'll put the link in the chat. I think Kim's already done that for you. Yes. So our first tip Saving regards the, the chat, chat file. file. So we recommend that the tech facilitator save the chat files from meetings. Um, when you're in the meeting, you can do that by clicking on chat. And then at the bottom of the chat window, you click the dot, dot, dot and save chat. Um, that saves the current version of the chat. So if you do it in the middle of the meeting, you're only gonna get half the chat file saved. Um, it does save it on, into your documents folder in a Zoom folder and then another folder with the meeting name, date and time. But if you wanna make sure that all of your chat files from all your future meetings get saved, it's really easy to do. You would go, you log into the Zoom website and go into the meeting settings where it says schedule meeting and change auto saving chats to on. And that way, whenever the meeting ends, it will save the chat onto the host's computer. And that'll be automatically going forward. Yes. Okay, so on the computer at the venue, you may find that a screen share is taking up most of the screen and it's hard to see the virtual attendees when they speak. So um, this Zoom tip is a way to make the video boxes larger so virtual attendees can be seen during a screen share. So I'm gonna play this for you to give you an idea about what I'm talking about. So this is a couple of ways you can kind of readjust your screen to give you maximum maximum look at what it is that you actually want to view. So you can see, you can just click that center bar and slide it back and forth to maximize the screen or the speaker, depending on which one it is you want to see. Hmm. I do not know why we went to that slide. Sorry guys, oh, there it comes, okay. Wait, let me go, back. yeah, this is where we need to be. So another way to access side-by-side -side mode is from the green bar that says you are viewing, right, and in this case right now, you're probably looking at a green bar at the top of your screen that says you are viewing Lori Thiel's screen. Do you guys see that? So you would click view options, look, look just to the right of that green bar, view options, and select side-by-side -side mode. If you can't find this option, go to Zoom settings and click screen share and then click the box to enable side-by-side -side mode. You probably have all already noticed that um, if you've done Zoom meetings these last, this last year, you probably know that different versions of Zoom offer different functionality. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but this is one of those situations where depending on what version of Zoom you're in, you might have a different functionality than what I just talked about here. Our next tip is about ensuring that the most important video always stays on your screen. When you join a Zoom, it usually shows you video of the person who is actively speaking, but you can also decide for yourself which video you prefer to view by pinning it. We suggest to the virtual participants of hybrid meetings that they pin the video of the venue 
So it always stays on their screen, even when other virtual participants are talking. To do that, they would put their mouse over the video they want to pin, click dot, 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 and select pin. Okay, so as we mentioned, it's the tech facilitator's responsibility to conduct Zoom votes. They can do that using polling, which requires them to write the motion prior to the vote. And by the way, that's how we're gonna be voting in plenary because our staff and our um, state league members have pulled together the motions already. So that's the way we'll be voting this weekend. Um, or you can use the reaction buttons, which can be used without the pre-planning. So you don't have to pre-write a motion or in, any information like you would in a poll. So in this example that you see here, we're showing how to conduct a vote using the raise hand and the yes, no reactions. So when the meeting facilitator calls for a vote, she should ask attendees to click either raise hand or yes, no. So if I'm running a meeting, I should already know how to tell my attendees how to pr proceed. Um, and then depending on your version of Zoom, your or your attendees version of Zoom, I should say, these reactions will be either under the reaction button that you can probably all see right now in the bottom of your screen or in older versions, it's under the word participants, which is to the left of the reaction buttons on most of your screens. So the tech facilitator will be able to view the information on the participant list. And if you look at the, the blue arrow, you can see that it references the tally in both of these circumstances, whether it's a tally of raised hands or whether it's a tally of yes, no votes. That's how the um, tech facilitator can tally the votes that have been called for. So as I said, the, the yes, no reactions are temporary on older versions of Zoom. So upgrades of Zoom now allow you to keep those reactions on your screen for a long time, but it has to be the latest version. Anybody with an, with an older version, if they use a reaction, uh, the yes, no reaction, it will only stay up for a little while. So, you know, there are some issues depending on what version that your attendees are trying to use. Also older versions, as I said, have the raise hand and yes, no on the participant screen versus in the, in the reactions column. So if a participant clicked raised hand, the tech facilitator can lower their, their hand by hovering over their name and clicking lower hand to clear all at once. I mean, I'm sorry, to, to click lower hand. And then to clear all at once, you just click more and then clear all feedback. So that information you'll be able to see uh, when you go in and try to manage this aspect of your meeting. I see a lot of people raising their hands. So we're uh, enjoying trying this out. Okay, so this is our last slide. I wanted to provide this information for you so that you can keep in touch with us. This is our website. You can see right here, lwvsandiego.org, where we've posted our slides and they'll also be available to you through LWVC, um, as will this video. So now I'm gonna stop screen sharing and we'll take some questions. Kim, you had a chance to look at anything and yeah, so Betsy mentioned that she does not have the yes, no options in reactions. And then I, I suggested that she looked in participants, but she says she only has the option to rename. So I, it used to be on the participants list, it used to be at the bottom. Um, so check there underneath all the names. To give you a sense of how different people's or different versions of Zoom provide different functions, when Kim and I were working on this this week, she was logged in on two computers at her house and I was logged in on my laptop and all three of our computers had a different version of Zoom. So it's really interesting that the how many different versions there are out there since we all started using it a year ago. And Doreen has had her hand up for a while. Did you wanna ask a question? You should be able to unmute now if you would like. Yeah. yeah I. I forgot that I had it up. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, that's okay. What um, about you, Catherine? Think, Did you want to ask yeah. a question? Um, actually, yes, if I could. Um, two questions, if I can squeeze them in real fast so as not to take other people's time. Um, the uh, description of the layout of the venue that you presented is clearly geared to meetings. 
What we have been doing is webinars, Zoom webinars for 60 to 90 people with a remote speaker. How do we manage? And we would have to put that speaker on a big screen, not just a large computer and set the room up so that those who want to come in person see the screen in the room. Those who are attending virtually see him on their computer and we manage somehow to do Q and A. Have, have you explored that at all? Because that's our concern, not so much the small meetings. Right, well, one of the reasons, as I said, we tried to gear this discussion to what we perceived would be the easiest and most simple and least expensive way to do it. So as you all know, meetings is less expensive than webinar. Webinar is a, has a more expensive fee associated with it. So we didn't really talk about it in, in terms of the webinar, but I get your point. So um, in our meeting room, for example, in our conference room in our office, we do have a big screen TV. It's not just a monitor. It's an actual TV that hangs on the wall. And we can connect our computers to it, but it's not an actual computer monitor. And by that, I mean it does not have a microphone and a camera. However, you all probably have already decided and discovered, just like we have, that you can purchase a microphone, a ring mic with a lighted um, camera and a um, insert and a intact microphone and you can attach it pretty much anywhere you want to provide that feed for your zoom meetings so you know you can cobble together different products to provide the setup for yourself um my i use a razor and it's 99 and um kim knows some of some other products too that would per, perhaps assist you in that Thank you. My other quick question was um, for registration and sign in. If I have a hybrid meeting and some of the attendees are registering via Zoom or, you know, into Zoom and signing in on the Zoom link, and others are registering with Evite or Eventbrite or whichever, we happen to use something called Fundly, but we're not too happy with it. Um, and then they physically walk into the space, how, and they're signing in. If they sign in by just writing, checking off their names on a piece of paper, I am not capturing that sign in in any electronic way so that I can use that. Right now, what we're doing is monitoring sign-ins versus registrations and sending response emails to people and so on. Um, what would you suggest doing so that we can automate the actual attendance sign-ins at a hybrid meeting? Well, Eventbrite allows you to, it, it actually captures their sign-in information and it allows you to actually allow, give, get them to use their phone to check in with you when they arrive. So it has a lot of functionality that's digital and it provides you opportunities to create name badges if that's what you decide to do. It creates its own attendance list. So if you just want to have some of your um, volunteers at the door with an actual printed checklist, you can print that off from Eventbrite. Or if you don't wanna have that happen, you can have your attendees just show on their phone when they come the, their confirmation and then you can check it off that way. So Eventbrite is a really useful tool. It has a lot of functionality. Kim, you probably have some other things you could add to that. So you were saying that you have some people walk into the event, but if you've had no contact with them until they get there? No, no, I'm saying if I do a hybrid event, so they can register to attend. So we have their name saying they've registered. And then those who attend in person, as opposed to those who sign in as attendees on Zoom, walk into the room and in some way indicate that they actually came. We like to capture the information of those who register and those who attend. So we can send emails, respond to questions by email and compare attendance to registration. Um, I'm looking for an automated simple way to capture the attendance, the physical attendance of those who say they who registered to attend in person, if you're following me. Yeah. You know, give the check-in people tablets with 
a file on it. I, you know, I don't know how this can be done. Well, we, yeah, you can definitely do it with Eventbrite. If mm -hmm. they had a tablet. Yeah, we've done that. We've used both. Uh, we've done printed checklists mm -hmm. of like individuals, and then you can literally just check a name. I mean, it, it comes off, it prints out like a checklist. Or again, you can just do it digitally. Your attendees can just use their, they can just show you their confirmation on their phone okay. and sign in that way. Eventbrite. It's very functional. Thank you. Um, Marianne? So, um, so my question has to do with how, how, um, how large is your league? I know San Diego is a huge geographic area as is Contra Costa County where I live. And we have members from a lot of different parts of the county and, and the league office is at, on one side of the county and members are all over and are you do you have a the same situation so it's really hard for members to get to your office yeah we do have um we have struggled in the past trying to get timing right so that people can get from for example work to the board meeting etc so that's one of the reasons we thought this was a very nice opportunity i'm gonna say versus challenge because when the restrictions from the pandemic required us all to be able, you know, to host meetings remotely, we we discovered this was a really good opportunity for some of our members who were struggling to get to meetings on time and, you know, get go from one meeting to a next. So yes, we have a very similar situation as you. And so this is, we hope to be able going forward to provide our members and our board members in particular, this opportunity to meet whether they decide to do it in person or virtually um, in, a, in a way that per, that allows us to have these hybrid meetings going forward. And you wouldn't consider just continuing the all Zoom meetings? Well, I'll tell you, if we host a board meeting, an in-person board meeting, and most people don't or nobody wants to show up, we would definitely just host it on Zoom. I mean, I'm trying to be flexible. You know, this, as Kim said earlier, we we're really trailblazing here. I mean, we did some research. I interacted with um, some people who had hosted some like a here in San Diego that hosted a hybrid gala event. And so I talked to the person who managed that event. We did some research on other organizations that had tried hybrid event, events. And it really does require to for it to come off nicely. It really does require a little bit more technology than what we've shown you here today. So for example, Kim has found a product that is like a 360 degree camera. And ideally, like if we were sitting in the middle of a room and half of our board was there in person and the other half chose to attend via Zoom, ideally the camera would circulate and highlight whoever's speaking in the room and put them on the Zoom call as a you know active speaker mode. So there, as I think as people move forward, you know, out of the pandemic restrictions and into more opportunities to interact in person, they're going to try to integrate these ideas that we discovered and, and actually like with new products and the development of new technology. So again, Kim's much more knowledgeable than I am about these tech technologies. Kim, do you want to talk about that camera or some of the other items that we, we've discussed? We budgeted to purchase the OWL device, and I'll put the link in the chat. Um, it's a thousand dollars and it's a tabletop device that sits in the middle of a conference table and it has a 360 degree camera. So it purports to be able to detect who's talking and send their video to Zoom. And the audio is like a, you know, a conference room audio bridge that, that picks up the sound from anywhere in the room. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's meant for eight to 10 people. It's not gonna solve the problems of, you know, a webinar or, a big community meeting or something like that. Right, and our discussion about candidate forums or the ideal week, we have not hosted a candidate forum with this new setup and this new technology. But in creating the presentation for you here today, we did do some research, we hosted some meetings. We, like I said, we interacted with people and 
did some um, interviews with people who had done something similar. And so those were our best recommendations to you. But again, you by the time you host your first candidate forum, you might there might be new technology that will help you be successful beyond what we've been able to share with you here today. So there have been a couple of questions in chat about updating your Zoom, because we've talked about that, different versions of Zoom. You can update your Zoom. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you not to do it right now, because when Kim and I realized that we hadn't updated ours, we began the upgrade, it just it ended our connection. So you can upgrade your Zoom um, your, to the latest version. Um, but you but you just don't do it right now. You'll just have to go into the Zoom app and it will give the option. It'll ask you, it'll tell you what version you have, and then it'll ask you if you want to upgrade. And then you just click that and it's very easy. And it'll up, it'll upgrade for you. It'll ask you if you want to store this upgrade in the same place that you stored the last one. And it's just simple. You just click yes and then it'll do it. Then it'll kind of restart everything for you. And also someone asked back can over you to turn off. I'm sorry, Kim. Can you turn off captioning yeah, at the bottom ahead. under live transcript? Somebody's having an issue with that. Um, someone already answered that down below. Oh, okay, you can turn good. it off yourself. Excellent. And then um, I did post a link to the, the meeting owl is the 360 degree camera. Um, equipment recommendations, you know, we just used an iMac and um, a, a MacBook Pro, any computer, laptop you know it doesn't matter anything that can run zoom um although an ipad and iphone don't have all the same meeting controls for the host um so you know the tech facilitator should have a laptop if possible yeah a couple of the meetings i've been in the workshops i've seen this week um but there have been questions about how to manage all this and as you remember kim and i re highly recommend having two people running two different functions. It's really hard for the meeting, the person who's written the agenda and following the agenda and managing the meeting to be checking chat on a regular basis. And that's important information that needs to be given back to the person who is running the meeting in real life. Uh, and so uh, that's why we highly recommend having two different people working together to manage these meetings. Somebody also asked about the phone using, using your smartphone. Kim and I actually did talk about if we did have the uh, a featured speaker, maybe a candidate or two who were speaking into their device, we would recommend that they use their earbuds with a microphone so that it would perhaps capture more completely their comments and allow them to hear. Yeah, you know, well, but if you're setting up one phone at, at the podium, then obviously those people that come up to the podium are not going to put on headphones. Right. Um, but we, we do think that a phone in front of a podium would pick up the audio. We've also done a candidate forum where all of the candidates and the moderator were in, were in person, but all the attendees were at home. And so they were set up in a big, I think it was like a boardroom and they had each one had their own laptop and headphones and they just looked at their computer mostly. So I'm not really sure what the benefit was. People at home would have gotten the same experience if the candidates had been had at just home. Zoomed in. Yeah. But um, it worked flawlessly. Well, um, so yeah. Judy, thanks for clarifying because you said that by asking about equipment, you meant cameras and microphones. We don't use any cameras or microphones. We are just using what comes with the computer. So the Mac has the camera and the microphone built in and we just use that. And like, it keeps seems to keep coming up about whether it's a PC or not. It it really doesn't matter. Once you're logged into Zoom, you are just a device. Um, Carol looks like she asked about um, teachers in a classroom. That's a really good point. One of the first things we did when Kim and I were trying to pull together the details for how to host a hybrid meeting was to get information about how teachers were using it in the classroom. So the two different people I spoke with said that way they were doing it was they would have they would present in per the teacher would present in person with their Zoom, with their camera and their laptop open to Zoom. And all the attendees in class also had their laptops open and were also on Zoom. So in-person attendees, even though they were in person, they were still using Zoom. 
because at some point during some of these classrooms, the teacher might want to break, do some breakout sessions. And that way she could actually send the people who were in real life into a virtual breakout room. So, um, and both, and the two different teachers I spoke with told me that that's how they do it. I spoke with a teacher here in the Santa Cruz Unified School District, and she said that's how she did it. And I also spoke with one in the Poway School District, and that's how he does it as well. And Poway actually got up and running a lot faster than um, San Diego did. So, but they're both using, they're conducting their classrooms in a similar way. But if any of you have any better ideas about how classrooms were conducted or know of different ways that they were um, being conducted, you know, in real life versus virtual, feel free to chime in. And Maddie asked, is there a trick to making sure everyone who is around the table on site is heard in Zoom. This is one of the things that we were so pleasantly surprised about mm -hmm. is that we were sitting at a conference table that was at least 12 feet long. So we were quite a distance away from this iMac. And we asked the people who were on Zoom, we said, can you hear us okay? And they said, yeah. And so we, we really just kept lowering our volume and realized we didn't have to yell at all. We could just use our completely normal voice and they could hear us perfectly. Yeah, it was surprisingly, it was surprising well done. But again, if you struggle with, the size of your room, or you feel like you need to supplement what we've talked about here today, there are a lot of different options out there. As I said, I am looking at you right now through a $99 Razer ring light that has a built-in mic and a camera. So um, if you need another microphone, if your table's too large, or if you're in a room that has more people or whatever, you can supplement with microphones if you need to. I see Martha Cox. Martha, your hand is raised. What would you like to say? Yeah, a question on uh, PowerPoint presentations in a Zoom. Um, somehow when I do these as a screen share, uh, um, the PowerPoint itself just obliterates the entire Zoom control presentation. So I can't see the chat. I can't see you know what's happening. And I can tell that others have this um, situation as well, because some aren't using the PowerPoint presentation. They've kind of got the, you know, version where you're working on it. And so I wonder, Kim or, or Lori, what are the settings that you might use? And is it done from the presenter view or the host view? Oh, well. So there's one thing, I'm not sure if this would fix the problem you're talking about as the person who's doing the screen share, but if you are annoyed that when someone else is screen sharing, it takes over your whole computer, you can change that by going into your Zoom apps video settings. And the quickest way to get there is that little arrow next to your stop video or start video button. Okay. If you click that and go to video settings. Okay. And then um, in the left side, click sh share screen. Yeah. And the first one is window size when screen sharing. And mine is on maintain current size because I don't want it to take over my whole screen. Okay. I'm not sure what the default is, but if it's on full screen mode for you, then changing that might fix this for you. Okay, perfect, perfect. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, somebody asked me to put some information about my, my camera in the chat. So I'll do that right now. Carol, do you have a question? Well, um, you know, I think what I don't know if who who asked that other question about the screen not being able to see the controls. If you're the presenter in uh, Mac, you go into your PowerPoint ahead of time. I forget what the setting is. Maybe already people know that, but you say something like play this through the internet, then you share the screen and it doesn't take over your controls. I will tell you a trick that Kim and I, we've learned a lot of things just pulling this presentation together for you all. So I shared my screen with you tonight. We developed our slideshow. We, well, our league uses G Suite. And so part of the functionality of G Suite includes slides, Google Slides. So she and I collaborated on those slides. And then when I, it was time for me to share my screen, I clicked under there's a drop down menu under present at the top of my slideshow and the very first option allows me to click 
with presenter notes so that I see my presenter notes, but you don't. You probably all have in the course of this convention seen people trying to read their speaker notes or maybe their speaker notes were displayed right alongside their slideshow that you saw. And that's been problematic, I think, for a lot of people trying to present and read their, their slide notes at the same time. Well, Google Slides solves that for you. And I literally found that solution by typing in Zoom share Google Slides mm -hmm. into Google, and it was the top search result. Right. So as I, even though I was sharing my screen with you, I was you weren't seeing what I was seeing, which was my speaker notes and my slides, because that is a special option that that I was able to just to click and take advantage of. Also, Google Slides. It still enabled me, even while I was screen sharing, to see all the other functionality that Zoom had. So while I was sharing my screen, I could ch I checked your chat comments. So I was still able to participate fully in the Zoom experience while I was still screen sharing with you. So I just put my razor information. It's just an Amazon link that you probably see there. Anything, any other questions that we've missed, Kim? No, there's a question here about a timer app. So Kim's son, who is a computer scientist, he created an app for us early on during candidate forums at the beginning of the pandemic. And we used it in the bottom corner of the screen to kind of keep up with how, you know, do our jobs to keep the timer apprised and keep the, Canada surprised, but it turns out that um, a lot of, as I was saying earlier, and Kim mentioned this as well, technology is moving so quickly that before we even got around to like sharing that app with other people who needed it, Zoom had created one for us. So, you know, a lot of these, or no, it was Blue Mountain that we ended up downloading, right? Blue Sky, I think. Blue, Blue Sky. Sky. So there are a lot of um, companies out there that are actively producing technology right now to answer some of the problems that we've experienced, you know, like with the timer, for example, that Karen mentioned in her chat. Um, so even though we created our own timer initially, it turns out there was one that I ended up having, you know, being able to recommend to other people that they could use and download for their own uses. Put that in the chat. Yeah. So there that was one's one not comment. free. I, I think it was like 10 or $20 a month. Maybe a little more. Well, one, another thing that our league, tr another problem we wanted to address was providing translation. So we did a, an extensive review. We did a ton of research on how to provide translation service, et cetera. And then boom, before we could even actually allocate funds to create a transcription service, Zoom came out with a transcription service. So you all probably noticed here tonight that that was an option for you. Um, Catherine, do you have a question? Sure, am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah just one more thing about candidate forums. Um, they actually do allow multi-language interpretation, simultaneous interpretation, and um, it worked fine. We did it at uh, at least one or two forums. Um, you still have to pay the interpreter, but that's something else. But the interpretation for those who choose to hear it and see it is, is a standard Zoom function. Um, what we found in candidate forums is for timing, the candidates are so used to seeing the league lady holding up her paddle, you know, that what we ended up doing was we made our timekeeper a panelist at the forum and um, she held her panel up and she was on screen and visible. Um, and that meant that the candidates could see her and the attendees could see her. Um, and she did it for you know, 30 seconds left and so on. Uh, it worked just fine. And it also gave another volunteer something to do, which is a good thing. We yeah, we started did, with that. We maintain our, our volunteer um, <laughs> work by the the way our timer was set up one of the remote volunteers was able to run it and we did one we, we started like that too but um we were glad that we went to a 
virtual timer, especially when one of our forums got picked up on the news and it, you could see our, our faces on the news and our nice clean green box with a one minute remaining or whatever, instead of yeah, some lady with a paddle. The lady with the paddle. Yeah. But we did have a lady with a paddle in early on. We did start with that for sure. That's that's classic league right there. Okay, are there any other questions? I've been scrolling through. Someone mentioned with candidate forums um, allowing attendees to submit their questions in advance. So that was also something that we did, which we found very helpful. Um, it was actually in their Zoom confirmation e email. It said, go to this website to type your questions. And then that way we could collect all the questions on the website and sort them and organize them and rate them and you know correct typos and have them all ready for the moderator to read. Yeah, that organization actually did help. I moderated a couple of events and our secretary, uh, Donna, who is on this uh, workshop today she, as an attendee, she was our go-to moderator, but having that, those pre-submitted questions and, and organized, uh, we organized or Kim created an app that allowed us to organize them in a way that clustered series of questions that were obvious, you know, follow-up questions to each other. So it was a really very nicely done way to kind of pre-arrange for the moderator um, so that they're not scrambling in real time trying to get questions and manage the whole event on the spot. Um, Karen Bricker mentioned that their timer also randomized the candidate order for answering the questions. So I'd like to hear more about how that was done. Yeah, they, I've never moderated uh, myself, but it, that always <laughs> seemed like the hardest part was figuring out the order. But we had the we had a timer, a person operating the timer, and so if a candidate, let's say we had nine or ten candidates, if the same person kept getting number one or the last position, they were able to override that. So they watched for it so that nobody was number one or the last one more than twice. Um, and so that worked great. It was these were all really wonderful ways uh, to use Zoom, make it easier than the in-person form. Yes, and Karen, earlier you mentioned that you had um, attracted a lot, a lot more in attendees online. And that reminded me, we, with our candidate forum, found that more people watched later on YouTube than attended live on Zoom. Yes. So we had it too. there's definitely a lot of people that, that want to participate, but aren't available on, in the evenings when, when these candidates are doing forums with us. Yeah, hundreds of people watch some of these forums and the, the pros and cons that we did too. So it was great to be able to watch that grow. Yeah, we got, didn't we get over a thousand to watch our October 3rd pro and con? Something like that. Yeah, it, that's a really good point because the pros and cons in particular, because they're so detailed here in California, you know, a lot of those um, ballot measures are just very complex. People just really enjoyed the, those ballot reviews and pros and cons we did. So that's another really good use of recording it and keeping it around for a while for future view. Catherine, I see your hands up again. Do you have another comment, question? I know I don't want to take all the time. But no, I'll, go ahead. Okay, on the candidate forums again, because that was the ideal use of Zoom. Uh, we love doing them on Zoom. Um, for some of the people who've asked questions, for the random sam the way the candidates get the random order to answer the questions, we just had the moderator ahead of time make for herself a cheat sheet with a color and a number. And then in the practice session before we opened the forum to the public, we had each candidate select a color. And so she just told them, your number is one, two, three, four. And they renamed themselves on the screen with the number of their order for answering questions on the screen. Um, so, you know, that kept everybody knew exactly who was going to go next. It helped. Yeah, that's a good idea. There are a lot of good ideas about how to make sure that your candidates are feel fairly treated so that you can roll through each candidate. You know, not the same one doesn't get the first question every time, as, as we all know, that's just part of how we, that's our reputation as being fair to candidates, making sure they all have equal access and equal time. So, and there are a lot of really good ways to do that, that are, you know, that we've probably discovered more now since we've been doing Zoom. So thanks for that. That's a good tip. And Robin had asked how we collected the questions 
before the candidate forum. So I put in the chat a link to the custom website that we built. It was just really simple. You would um, select from a drop down box which event you were going to attend and then type your question and hit submit. Um, and then on the back end, it was a little more complicated with a database that allowed us to sort and, and do different things with the questions once we receive them. But you could do something as simple as a Google form, which just puts them on a spreadsheet and then you could put them in different orders or edit them or whatever you need to do. Yeah, if you've ever used the Q&A function on Zoom, it, we set ours up kind of similar to that so that you could see it, the questions. And then once you ask it, you could get rid of it. You could click it off or, or move it to a, you know, another category or column. So it was very helpful for our, mod I moderated several of those. And like I said, Donna did more, many more than I did. And we, we found it very helpful to just kind of keep our minds organized in the midst of what in some cases weren't, you know, could, could be a, could have been confusing candidate forums. And a little while ago, Sean had mentioned that um, you can do the same thing with PowerPoint as far as being able to see your speaker notes. Would you mind sharing we don't use PowerPoint a lot, but once in a while I do, and I'd like to know how to be able to see my speaker notes and share the screen of the presentation. Is Sean still with us? I am. I'm sorry. I was busy trying to figure out how to get myself visible again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I use PowerPoint. And when you go to um, the menu bar at the top, you click on slideshow. And then once you've clicked on slideshow, you go over to from the beginning, and that's the um, left corner. Um, and then your, your program will come up, your slides will come up, and you, you kind of have to wait like maybe two or three seconds. And at the very bottom left, if you um, hover your your uh, cursor down there, you'll see in shadow, um, there'll be like the uh, little mic, what do you call it, uh, magnifying glass, and next to it are the three dots. Um, there's other things that are there too, if you want to um, use them, but the three dots, when you click on that, it'll bring up a, 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 a menu that you can choose to see your presenter notes. And then what happens is you see your notes on, on the right side with the slide on the left and above your notes shows you the next slide coming. And when um, you're presenting, your attendees only see what you want them to see and that's the slide on their full screen. Yeah, that's so exactly how this worked for me. What you just described is exactly what I was seeing as I was presenting. So what you described with the slide, the first and the next slide, and then the speaker notes was for me a little box and kind of in the corner. And then mm -hmm. the real slide that you all saw was big on my screen. Is that what, is that kind of like what you were saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me a while to figure it out using the PowerPoint. Um, because I saw all the choices, but I never could get where I could see my notes that I had created until one day I was just sitting there looking at the screen with a slide on it. And all of a sudden I had moved my, cur my mouse and it went over to that lower left corner and, and kind of in this like watermark were these options. And I clicked on the three dots and that's when I figured out, oh, that's how I do it. And all of a sudden my screen changed. So it just, if you're not familiar with, and I know uh, there are a number of people who haven't um, used PowerPoint with Microsoft very often. And, and so when they're trying to do it, they, they can do that. They don't know how to do the notes. It took me a while to do it. Um, there was one other point I wanted to make about it, but it's not coming to my mind right now. Oh, I know what it was. Um, the thing about Microsoft, and I don't know if you found this, Lori, when you were doing yours, when you're actually creating your PowerPoint with your notes, the location at the very bottom under your slide is just so small for the, the line. I think it only offers you to see two lines of the notes you're creating. 
I don't well, know. Uh, that's as true. I said, we oh. used Google Slides versus mm -hmm. um, PowerPoint, but I know what you're talking about because I had to, um, you can, in this application, you can click and drag that line up to give yourself more space so that you can see your notes more and it, it diminishes the visual field of your slide. So perhaps that's also um, an option with PowerPoint. I don't know. Yeah, give Thank that a try. You. Yeah, sure, I will give that a try. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so click around. You know, this is, it's as Kim said, this is a learning experience. We are all still just finding our way through this new technology and trying to figure out how best to host and to keep, give our members access to our information, reach out to candidates, reach out to our officials. So I just recommend everybody just click around and spend some time and see all the options. I mean, a lot of these applications are very functional. They have functions that we don't even know and you won't know until you explore. So I agree, we should just all spend some time with our apps look around, see what's in there, see what our options are and share it with each other. You know, we can give each other updates and information on what we've learned. Even like here today, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from attendees who had additional information they could share. So I really appreciate your attendance here tonight. It's 6.02 and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, I, it was a very robust conversation. And again, thank you all for your time and for um, sharing your expertise with us. We look forward to even more opportunities in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.